All right, Marcia, are you good to go? I am. Awesome. Great. Well, I'm going to do a quick intro for you. <laughs> All right, and for all of you gathered here, <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Emily Krupczewski, and thank you for you joining us on Zoom as well. I won't forget about you, I promise. Um, and I'm the site manager here at Washington County Heritage Center. Uh, we are open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., so come stop by if you haven't already, which I know most of you here in person have. Um, we do have uh, some books for sale of Marsha's, and those of you who are online, we have those available here at the store, and if you want to purchase them afterwards, you're more than welcome to see Kimberly at the front. Um, there are restrooms uh, out this hallway here and around the corner or in the lobby as well, so if you need one of those, that's where they are. And um, before I introduce Marsha, I just want to mention a couple of our next events that are coming up, and I know some of you guys, I talked to you about these beforehand. Um, one week from today, Wednesday, April 27th at 7 p.m., we have local historian and researcher Fritz Anderson, that's a nickname, uh, <laughs> he's uh, coming to present on the Red River Matisse or Matisse community, depending on how, um, which origin you are, <laughs> you might say it differently, and uh, they're a unique ethnic group and he has done tons of research on this community, so if you're interested in indigenous people, this is another one that would be good to come to, and again, that's next Wednesday day at seven. After that, our Warden's House Museum opens up for the season on Sunday, May 1st. Um, so we're real excited to have that back open and we'll have weekly tours Thursday through Sunday there um, on the other side of Stillwater. Uh, we also have Clyde Deppner. He is the curator for the Minnesota Twins. And we're very excited to have him come. He's going to be here Thursday, May 5th here at the Heritage Center at 7 p.m. as well. Um, you can always check out our website for all those dates too. Um, yeah, but for tonight, we are very excited to have Marsha Anderson with us. Uh, she is the expert on all things Ojibwe bandolier bags. A little intro on her. Uh, she is the author, of course, of A Bag Worth the Pony, The Art of the Ojibwe Bandolier Bag. Marsha holds many titles, including curator, author, material culture specialist, not many people can say that, indigenous culture specialist, fine arts or fine crafts specialist, and professor, among many more. She has worked as the curator of Minnesota Historical Society's three-dimensional collections for 30 years, and her book, A Bag Worth a Pony, is described as beautifully illustrated, creatively researched, and sensitively written. She's done very hard work connecting the specific pieces to their Minnesota communities of origin, and when possible, she has also been able to track down the individuals who made them and the individuals' families. So that's a really special thing as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marsha. So thank you for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Uh, I guess I will just start with a little preparation about my time at, as a curator at the collections at the Historical Society so you can get a sense of how the Bandelier Bag book came to be. I started uh, working at the Historical Society in 1981 and my first job was to in, unpack and inventory the collections that had been in warehouse storage for a very long time. And so it, every day was an adventure. And uh, it was a couple, about a year into the project that I started opening boxes that what we would call a B case, um, which uh, were very heavy, but when we opened them didn't have, didn't seem to have much in them, but they were housing these very heavy beaded bags, uh, just Thrown, kind of thrown in there. They weren't padded or anything, and they were all in a pile at the bottom of the box. And as I began finding them, uh, which turned out to be about 150, I was pretty amazed that a collection of that type existed. The collections were about a quarter million then, and so 150 doesn't sound like very much, but when you find a single sort of iconic object uh, in that quantity, it tells you something about uh, its significance. And so it just sort of spoke to me at the very beginning. Um, this is the book, it's available in the shop there. Um, the title, A Bag Worth of Pony, is the part I always forget to tell everybody about, so I'm not gonna forget it today. Um, I used so many incredible resources to research these objects, and one of them, was a sort of newsletter of the uh, Episcopal Church in the 1870s to, to the 1890s. 
And in 1870, I found um, uh, a small article by Reverend Gilfillan about um, these bags. And uh, he had spoke about them and said that they were so valuable that the women would make them over the winter and one of them would be traded with the Indians of the Plains for a pony. And um, this was the one thing that the Ojibwe needed was, was, was horses and they would every year get them from their fellow folks out west. And um, this was a very important um, economic tool, the Bandler Bay. Um, the other thing I did um, for most of the book was try to use the Ojibwe name for the book bag as much as possible. And the name is Gashkibadagan. It's not that hard if you practice it. <laughs> and you get used to it as you read through the book. Um, the plural of Gashkibadagan is Gashkibadaganag. You just add an A-G to the end. So there it is. Uh, can they see this? They can't see the screen yet, can they? Right. Okay. Oh, they can. Um, oh, can they? Oh, all right. Um, so, um, so began the unpacking and finding the bandolier bags. And so in 1982, I went to Mille Lacs and met with two of our um, most precious elders uh, who had been guides at the museum for decades and who were still active craftswomen, um, Batiste Sam and Madi Keg and um, interviewed them on a portable tape recorder. Oh, I think of all the things I could have and should have asked them and didn't, but it's, instead got me started on the journey and um, they remained very good friends of mine until their deaths uh, decades later. Um, so the advantage of this project was that it was kind of, again, like I said, the boxes of bags spoke to me, but the collections at the Historical Society are so incredibly rich in historic photographs, in documentation of everything from uh, traders to uh, Indian agents, um, government records, uh, biographies, just just an, an oodle and oodles of information, and then lots of. Native American collections, which ended up at the Historical Society, were acquired from collectors. And these individuals had different reasons or abilities for collecting. They were, they were road builders, so they were out near the reservation. Um, they were teachers, they were doctors, they were uh, uh, religious uh, instructors. So they, had, they were the people that had the specific connections with the tribes, and um, they were the ones who often made collections. And the interesting thing about the bandolier bags is um, they were only one or two times collected specifically as just them as objects. The rest of the time, they were always just part of larger collections of Ojibwe and Dakota material from Minnesota. So that was sort of interesting to me was to see that they weren't always just standing alone by themselves. Um, so um, while I was working at the Historical Society, I was the collections liaison to the permanent Indian Advisory Committee at the Historical Society. So we had representatives from all 11 reservations in Minnesota, and um, we stayed in, in touch that way for the, my entire career, which was a real advantage for me because I had more than one way to um, stay involved and in connection with uh, Native folks. Um, and the book took me about 35 years to finish. <laughs> um, I worked on it off and on while I was working. It was a big job, a full-time job, and so I would do a presentation for a conference as the beginnings as one of my chapters. So that's over the course of several decades. I started building the book, but I didn't get to finish writing it till I retired, and it came out in 2017. Um, I think the thing that was really a commitment for me was that the book was to be affordable enough so that Native people could buy it um, and it had to be respectful and it had to be their voices as well as mine. So um, it took, it takes a long time to develop the relationships that allow you to really write a book like this and a lot of uh, my Native friends don't want to about the culture, their history. So this was a 
was a really gift from them to me as well to allow them to write this book. Um, when I started the book, there weren't that uh, many people making them anymore. They were considered just sort of ancient objects. And by the time I finished, they were popular again and being uh, made and they are still being made today by lots of different um, artists in the community. So um, let me start the, the PowerPoint, uh, Emily. Yep, you're good to go. Okay. All right, whoa, <laughs> sorry. I'm a little sensitive here. All right. So there it is, a little reminder for you. The word, uh, the plural word for bandolier bag is gosh, give a uh, So say that over to yourself quietly. Um, so what I'm gonna do first is just show you some historic photos of them. Um, you don't have to really learn anything specific from these, but I just wanted to sort of run some of the earlier images by you so you can see these, uh, you can see that they change in size and design. And um, we'll talk about that a little more. So this first slide, um, the men on the left are um, posing at Mille Lacs. Um, they are illustrations in a book called Cathio that was published in 1901. So we know that um, this image that, and the people in it, the pictures of them and their bags predate 1901. So probably they're wearing bags that were made in the 1890s. Both of them are wearing the pretty original, the, the original size of the bags was pretty much like this. Uh, not really large, but um, bigger than a, a small pouch or carrying, uh, carrying bag. The photo on the right is of Chief White Cloud from White Earth, and that photograph dates to 1895. We have several photos of him um, wearing beadwork and other regalia. And um, this one's unusual. I'd like to post it because there's so few of them known out there, both photographs or objects. Um, at some point, uh, the women artists were combining, in this case, a loom woven strap with a spot stitched floral pocket panel. So you'll get that, you'll get more later. So this next um, slide is uh, again, on the left, two men. Uh, from Mille Lacs, also illustrated in that 1901 publication called Cathio. And this is a little different because you'll see that the man on the left is wearing a, a floral spot stitch bag, and the man on the right is wearing a, a not typical Ojibwe style loom woven bag. He's probably, his bag is probably from Wisconsin, Menominee, or Potawatomi, but not sure, not typical Ojibwe, but the size and the function is the same. This slide, uh, the picture on the right is of Pete Moose. The collections, I'll keep saying we because I've been doing it for 30 years, so you'll forgive me, I'm not at MHS anymore, but they're still my collections. <laughs> and uh, there's two photographs of Pete, this front view and a side view. It apparently came from two different uh, uh, donors or sources uh, but they have different dates. One is dated 1910 and the other is dated 1912. And um, they were both uh, made on the same day, obviously, in, in uh, Ross Daniels studio near um, Hinkley, which was active during the 1910s. And um, now if you looked at these two photos side by side, you can see the size of the bags on the left are, are not too big, but they're distinctive and you can see them from a distance. And then you can see how much bigger these bags are that Pete is wearing on the image on the right. And they, you'll learn a little bit more about the motifs on the bags, but they're typical um, of the Mille Lacs community. In, uh, there was a, a big push um, at the turn of the century to get a lot of the Ojibwe people at the different reservations to move to White Earth. Uh, and a lot of them fought it, some went, removed, and others did not. And um, one of the holdouts was, was Mille Lacs. And in 1905, a group of people from Mille Lacs did remove to White Earth, and this is their sort of celebratory photograph on that day in 19, <clears throat> 1905. Uh, the man in the back row, uh, three in from the right, is a man well-known named Chief Round Earth. And uh, there's another person in the back on the other end wearing two bags, and there's a young man in the front uh, browning in a bag. <laughs> and um, the um, Brown Earth, his wife was named um, 
central rock woman. She was pretty well known, which was not typical. Women bead workers, uh, bead artists, were didn't talk about themselves as artists, and so um, that kind of um, name uh, recognition was not common or popular. Uh, but she was documented in several different collections uh, that we had access to, and um, she was one of the few uh, bead artists who actually did wear beadwork sometimes, and she often wore these bead chains, which were really popular in the first 20 years of the 20th century. And she's also holding a small purse in her left hand, a beaded purse. So her husband, um, Brown Earth of um, there is wearing a, a really big, um, wonderful collection of regalia. He's got uh, two bandolier bags on, a, a belt. I can't remember. And he has, I think he has loincloths on. I can't remember if he has also a vest on or not. And then he has headgear. And um, he, he, he was, <laughs> sorry, he was frequently photographed. Um, wearing um, this gear, um, both in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere, and none of the regalia was ever really um, found. Uh, we were never able to track it down until, oh, about halfway into finishing my book, I was looking at some pieces that were donated by an Indian agent, and it turns out that he had this belt, which is very distinctive. And so we do end up having a one piece of, um, Chief Round Earth's uh, regalia in the collections, and so hopefully someday maybe some of the other pieces will surface. Um, the picture below is from 1910, one of the terrific resources for imagery and um, use of the bags uh, is from the collections of a variety of individuals who visited this powwow. The White Earth powwow was really huge, and, um, and I think the ones that we have the best photos from are from like 1895, 1905, 1910, 1912, years like that. Terrific photographs of all kinds of activities and individuals and pretty well documented too. And that's uh, this one here um, is from 1910. And when they did a lot of performance programmatic uh, entertainment as part of this powwow. Um, this was uh, on dirt roads and the, you all know where um, where white is and Manoman is roughly the, the powwow grounds location. And this was at this time that a lot of the people were arriving by horse and by wagon, and they had crowds of up to 3,000 people on the weekends at that time, which is to me just phenomenal because it would have been a pretty tough uh, uh, bed to, to get to. And they, they had it set up so people could bring their own tents and camp, and it was an amazing event. I would have loved to have gone. So, there are two primary kinds of bags that you would be aware of. Um, I, I can't remember, Emily, do you have both loom woven and spot stitch bags uh, on display? I know that we have the spot stitch, the loom woven we may have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's two kinds of uh, sorry, traditional methods of doing bead work in the Ojibwe. Uh, community, especially in Minnesota, and one is loom woven. And the technique that's used here for most of the loom work in the Great Lakes area is the square weave. And it requires a basic uh, wharf, and, wharf and weft uh, arrangement, but in doing it, the uh, weft passes through the row of beads twice. So it goes in one way, comes back out the other way. And so what you're seeing here is a detail of the the tab fringe and you can see that one side where the, and the outside they look different because there's different uh, a number of wrappings of the of the, the warp or weft. Um, the only way you can ever find these these um, salvage edges is on the the fringe tabs because the rest of the beadwork is tacked down to the fabric base and so you can't see the selvage. So the other kind which you're going to see mostly uh, on your own today um, uh, is the spot stitched floral bags. So the geometric um, loom woven ones, they were, they were basically constrained by the loom work technique to have hard edged, boxy, and often geometric designs. But the spot stitched bags uh, focus on floral and other decorative uh, motifs. The, the technique in Minnesota 
for spot stitched work is uh, the goal is for it to be as flat and smooth as possible. And if you look here at this detail, you can see, and that's, it's still kind of the same today, but it was even more of the case uh, in the 1800s and early 1900s. The beads in a hank of beads would be all kinds of different shapes and sizes. So they'd be thin ones and there'd be fat ones. And, and so a bead artist really had to be pretty good at figuring out how to make these things all fit nicely together, fill the space and uh, stay flat. So we think that the origin of the bandolier bags sort of evolved out of these finger woven sash bags. Um, there's probably only a dozen left in the world that I know of, and I think that's probably true. Um, this one on the left belongs to the Mia uh, right across the river in Minneapolis. So we're very lucky to have an original one in the, in the region available. And um, they started out being, um, a kind of sash or belt that was worn in the 1840s, 1850s, maybe even as early as the 1830s here in the region, mostly by Ojibwe, but also by Dakota individuals. It was often used as a belt, but it could also be worn across the shoulder under the other arm on the other side and just sort of looped over. So um, it became, um, it looked like a, a strap of something. And a lot of the photographs that I've had to use for research because the individual is seated. I can't tell if it's just a finger woven sash that I'm seeing or if the pocket of the bag is hiding under that person's elbow. Um, but we know that they started doing that and um, you can see clearly that this uh, bag itself, oh, I'm sorry, um, has uh, the same simple geometric design. The finger woven sashes of uh, wool yarn and then the beads are then woven in uh, by hand in a pattern. So it's a complicated little um, object, um, but uh, truly wonderful. The original sashes had very long fringe with lots of beads, sometimes pony beads, um, uh, sort of randomly added to the to the fringe. They were just elegant objects. So MHS has two of these in the collections. Um, one is usually on display at Mille Lacs, but uh, I don't know if it is right now. Well, so so this is when I started out um, doing this research. Um, the leads that I found, again, the historic photographs were the, were the wonderful, wonderful clue because in St. Paul, lots of uh, native leaders were coming to Fort Snelling and the Twin Cities and these photographers in St. Paul were where everyone went to have their photograph made. And um, so we have these incredible collections from the 1860s, and late 1850s, uh, documented the date, uh, the name of the individual, and the name of the studio. Well, it's pretty clear that these uh, small studios did a little bit of exchanging between each other of their props. And everybody knows that uh, studios, including Curtis and others, have used props in their uh, historic photos of Native folks. But um, the difference is um, that, yes, this is a prop. This individual is holding a pipe stone pipe and an early um, finger woven bag. But the other thing is it's, it's, a, it's a prop, but it's a period prop. So you know that it's got to e be either older or the same age as this time period of this documented photograph. So this was a really important discovery was to find um, Oh, I think there's a half a dozen different photos of these uh, of portraits of individuals wearing one this bag. Um, and, and in this particular picture, um, the uh, person wearing it is a, a Leash Lake band chief named Cabana K or Best Gambler, and it's dated to 1860. So what a gift to have this kind of documentation. I really felt like the collection just spoke to me. It was like a giant art material culture Petri dish. I mean, you really couldn't step away from it. The documentation and information was so exciting and so prolific. So um, the two kinds of bags that you really would see the most of, not the finger woven bags, but these, the loom woven panel bags and the spot stitch floral bags. The difference between the two is they both are have a cloth foundation, like a big bag with a strap. But um, for the loom woven bags, panels of beadwork are created on a loom 
and then they're attached to the fabric bag foundation. Um, these two details of the pockets that I'm showing you are two of my favorite bags. Um, the one in the middle um, dates, we know, to at least 1893 because it was purchased at Becker County, which is, means it was probably made by white earth women, and it was displayed in the World's Columbian Ex Exhibition in Minnesota in, the, <clears throat> in Chicago in the Minnesota building. And uh, the one on the left, also a favorite of mine, um, it illustrates what I think was a, another really common motif that appears over and over in the bags in Minnesota Ojibwe beadwork on these bags. If you, I call it the exploding X. And if you look at this one and you pull, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting that I can't click with this. But if you pull the yellow and blue bars on the two sides together, you'll see that it'll make an X. And the pink is just the sort of exploded version of it <clears throat> in the middle. And what well, the other favorite thing of uh, about beadwork in Minnesota Ojibwe work is there's always almost always pink, and that's not a standard color in a lot of other uh, communities or um, other uh, areas that do Ojibwe beadwork. And and that's also another special element. Okay, so if you look here. This is also an expanded X. It's just another form by this very inventive uh, bead artist. This gentleman on the right, I keep doing this, um, is uh, this is a photograph of him <clears throat> from 1894. The um, Bureau of Ethnology in Washington, D.C., another incredible resource. Um, most of those images are online now. And so when all these individuals from different tribes were going to Washington for treaties and other reasons, they would have their pictures taken <clears throat> for the archives. And um, this gentleman is from Minnesota and his name is One Called From A Distance, great name. He's wearing a great polka dot shirt, a bead on top of that, he has a bandolier bag with the straps tucked underneath it so you can only see the pocket panel and it's a floral spot stitched one. And then across his chest is another bandolier bag which is loom woven, but this woman desperately wanted to be doing flowers and she was a terrific bead artist. I just, this bag is incredible and I actually did find parts of it sometime. It's colorful in person too. And so in addition to that, he's also wearing a, a very traditional regional kind of headdress. Um, it's not clear what is underneath. Sometimes it was an animal skin, sometimes it was woolen cloth and that would be rolled up and then it would be wrapped with several pieces of uh, strips of loom woven beadwork. Um, terrific picture uh, and terrific bags. So that was going back, loom woven panel bags. Now we're going to look at the spot stitch bags. And this is the kind of bag that most people today think of, they think of bandolier bags, this is what they think of. Another large uh, group of, co a collection group at the Historical Society was made at uh, Air, uh, Mille Lacs Indian Museum. Uh, the Harry and Jeanette Air collected all kinds of beadwork from the Mille Lacs community and others nearby and had them on display always. And sometimes uh, members of the community who did demonstrations um, would wear this regalia. And the picture on the left is one of the many postcards that the heirs made to sell, uh, uh, showing members of the community wearing their uh, beadwork collection. And this is Tom Skinaway, 1925. He's wearing a terrific uh, Mille Lacs uh, style bag with some unusual motifs. And um, it is one of 23 bags from there in the collections. And you can see here, uh, right there, and on the side, there's three more. Those are a motif that um, represents a, a very prolific marshy plant in Minnesota called Arrowhead. And um, this is a, a good example of how some of these elements show up over and over in Minnesota Ojibwe beadwork. Okay, so the second one is also <clears throat> in the air collection, the one of the 23, and is a very sort of traditional format bag with the sort of the four direction uh, arrangement on the pocket, 
but it's to me it's it's what's perfectly identifiable as a Minnesota Ojibwe, which is the mixture of plants and berries and leaves and nuts uh, that none of which grow on the same uh, base but are all together on this bag. So we have oak leaves, we have acorns, we have blueberries, we have realistic rosebuds, um, grape and maple leaves. Um, it's just a fun bag. And uh, what's really nice about it is that it's a perfect example of one of the other elements that's almost always there in Ojibwe and their bags. Uh, and that is the vine element, which connects all of the single motifs that may or may not be connected to each other. Like there's a cluster there, but sometimes it's just a leaf, one or two that has to be attached. Um, same as uh, the base on the pocket panel. And then this one also shows you some of the more frivolous um, elements that were used sometime in this case for a popular uh, sort of highlight de de decoration. And the one on the far right um, is not from Mille Lacs, it's from White Earth. And at the White Earth powwow, White Earth is a big reservation, and there was often in a smaller part of the reservation, there'd be a, a, a more traditional powwow sometimes, and sometimes just for veterans. And this was one of those. This man was Herbert McDuffie. In 1920, he was there visiting, I think, and he was asked by other Native veterans from White Earth to join them in a dance they were doing. And he recorded the whole thing and saved it in a letter that was donated with this uh, beadwork uh, to the collections. And he felt like he was not going to be able to last. He said it was lasted like 45 minutes. He just didn't think he could stay on his feet that long. Um, but it was really wonderful. And at the end, after it was over, someone came up and, and gifted him with this bag, which at the time was not... Uh, completely connected. So the strap is separate, but it clearly was made as a, <clears throat> as a bag to, and was a beautiful piece of beadwork to give away as a gift. Um, and so this is the beginning of what happened to Vandalier bags um, in the 20th century as the pockets got bigger and bigger um, and they became no longer a functional bag. And this is a faux or fake strip of beads in the panel to look like an opening, but it isn't one. Um, this artist has also rendered a, a horizontal element to look like the part that is shown over the pocket opening. And then she has a square area below that represents a pocket panel. Um, terrific bag. And um, so Mr. Duffy gave that collection with his uh, record of the whole event to the collections, another terrific resource. Marcia, we do have both types of bandolier bags here at the Heritage Center. Now that you explained both of them, I can say we have both. <laughs> oh, good, good. Um, so, um, so where did they get this idea? You, we, I've shown you some bags, not so many yet, but you look at, uh, remember, talk about the vines and notice how we've got maple leaves and flowers and, and water lilies and uh, nuts and uh, I don't know what these are, buds on a vine. And none of these things are um, live together on the same plant. Um, this is a mixture of beautiful imagery tied together by these vines. Well, um, where did that concept come from? Well, in the 18th century on the east coast of uh, North America, um, Indian palampores were introduced and these are big, uh, uh, big pieces of cotton with block printed uh, designs that were used as bed covering elements for big poster beds like curtains to keep people warm. Um, it's unlikely that any of these made their way to the Midwest or even further west. Um, but if you look at these designs and the, the sort of tree-like foundation and the vines holding all these different shapes and colors and sizes of stuff, and you think, wow, I, I did, I don't know how many books on the history of textile printing I went through and hardly ever found uh, anything other than this. So what do you think this inspired um, the Ojibwe women and their um, bandolier bag panels? 
I, I don't know, but it seems to be the only safe guess because by the 19th century, the um, American um, printed uh, cotton industry was taking those palimpores and turning them into polished cotton chintz prints. And these were heavily used um, for backing quilts, for doing applique quilts, and, and Native women and non-Native women were all making quilts and um, doing embroidery and all kinds of things. And these are clearly inspired by the palimpores and very similar, especially this one, I think. Um, to many of the panels that the Ojibwe women did in their bandolier bags. So the other thing I hardly ever do is say I know where this came from or how this originated because it, it's too hard to, it's sort of an irresponsible thing to do and I think it's pretty hard to do, but sometimes something uh, jumps out at you. Um, this is a bag that was collected um, in uh, Nine, just before, oh, let's think, think, it was collected in 1910 um, uh, by a man whose collection is at the Logan Museum at Beloit in uh, Wisconsin. And um, this poem was collected from a man named Gewitt Aguinas, who um, was also eventually interviewed by Francis Densmore, and he sang several recorded songs. So we now, we have this man, we have him, we have his uh, reservation tie and we know a little bit about him and mm, not much else, but that's more, more than you usually have. And here's this wonderful bag. And um, most women uh, didn't care much about what happened on the back of the bandolier bag. It could be muslin, it could be bed ticking, it could be scraps of pen fabrics put to pull together to cover the back of the bag. Um, but sometimes they use bandanas, um, and in this case, that's what happened. I think if I recall, it's probably parts of at least two bandanas, uh, but it's nice big chunks of, of yardage, and it's really fun to look at because the, the border around the outside edge of the bandana is um, full of this repeat of this little framed motif, which is a water lily blossom, a lily pad, and two folded leaves. And there's another one over there. Lancelet folded leaves, I went through a lot of research for that. It doesn't show up that often when you think of all the leaves that show up in uh, historic for thousands of years or hundreds of years anyway of uh, printed fabrics. Um, I just didn't find much of it. So where well, there it is on, on the front of this bag are two folded leaves. Now, the Ojibwe beadwork tradition is not about three-dimensionality. It does happen, but this is very three-dimensional because of the folded uh, representation. And uh, it just jumped out. So I think it came from there. And then in 1920, um, a man named um, Stanford King, who was then the state auditor in Minnesota, was inducted uh, into the White Earth Band in 1924, for whatever reason that they were recognizing him. And, and during that ceremony, he was presented with a bag uh, made by a woman in the community. And there on the strap of that bag, which is in our collection, in the Historical Society collections, uh, um, is the water lily, the lily pad, and the folded leaves. And it's on the strap of the bag. Um, okay, I'm just putting it out there. So this is a panel that just shows you a lot of the kinds of uh, fruit and flowers and leaves and fruit that were, uh, that inspired the these bead artists to uh, represent them on their uh, bandolier bags and other kinds of uh, beaded objects as well. I used to think this was a, um, Mm. Oh, I can't think of it. Anyway, uh, a kind of fruit, but I realized after a lot of research that it's probably the quilt pattern that's known as the love apple. And it shows up a lot in different sizes, but often in this sort of larger size. There's berries that sometimes have spots on them, and then there's strawberries. There's the arrowhead leaf. Um, this is either a tulip form from an applique pattern, or it's also a, a flattened side view of a water lily. Um, there's a folded leaf 
This is a section that was a, that appeared above the opening of a pocket on a bag. And this is a repetitive motif that I've named the gear flower <laughs> um, that shows up pretty regularly. And then realistic rosebuds have been around on a native indigenous beadwork for hundreds of years, really. And uh, it's funny to me that that is one thing that never really stopped being realistic, even though a lot of the other things uh, came across in much different format, sort of a cookie cutter image. Also extraordinarily rare are um, photographs of uh, Native women doing beadwork. Um, and there's not a whole lot of documentation with this, but it is a, a group of women um, on the White Earth Reservation. The photograph is in the archives of, of St. John University in Collegeville. Um, the only person identified um, is this little girl, <laughs> hence the arrow, but we could not uh, track um, her down in terms of her, um, her role in the community or the reservation. Um, so there, this woman is making what I call the tourist bandolier bag, which was a small version, which didn't take so long and could be sold um, uh, readily in trading posts. Um, this uh, group down here and this woman up here are both using the very typical um, Ojibwe uh, basic uh, rectangular wooden loom for doing loom woven work. You can see she's got a, a, a wider strip running across this loom. Uh, but this woman um, is making one of those panel bag, later ones that probably doesn't have a pocket, but she does have loom woven tabs in the fringe. Um, terrific photograph, probably uh, late 1890s, turn of the century. One of my other favorite historic photos um, is this one. It showed up without any documentation or, at all in a 1951 report on Red Lake. And uh, we never did track down the negative or the publication uh, files because it was a state, a, a government publication. Well, we could never track it down. And this wonderful woman is sitting on the ground. She's making a floral spot stitch bag and she's working on a loom woven one, which is in her lap. Um, you can see her, her crutch in the foreground, so she probably had some disability issues and yet she's sitting on the ground doing this. And there are all of her strands. She strings all of her beads on a long thread Sometimes they were wrapped around newspaper, but I think in this case, they're wrapped around curls of birch bark. So she had a really great uh, sort of a, a spool uh, way of transporting her beads and keeping them separate from each other and finding her colors. So the whole uh, trick for this one was learning how to investigate the photo. And this box, which is probably her stool as well as her trunk, um, has a label on it for, um, a kind of, I think it was fly paper, tangle foot, yes, in um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And by researching the, com researching the company records, we determined that this particular logo um, existed in that business from the late 1880s to the early 1890s. So there it is, another, another way to find out roughly at least when this picture was taken and um, when this woman was at, at work. And Another a good example of how that's what was happening in the 1890s and turn of the century. The loom woven bags were becoming fewer and fewer and the spot stitch bags were becoming more and more popular. I never understood that because of course, uh, I get it because you want to do the floral motifs. Okay, that's understandable. But they're so much more work than the loom woven bags. That takes a much, much longer to do the floral bags because they fill in the entire background with beads. The one on the left is um, an unknown photo that showed up in many publications over the years. And um, I suspect she's a Great Lakes woman. Um, her, her bag panel, her bandolier bag panel, is not a typical Minnesota Ojibwe scale, but it might have been a Wisconsin um, bag. But her cradle board bands are beaded in a very standard, very typical Minnesota Ojibwe way. So just don't really know much about this uh, woman or um, this photograph, but it's, it's useful in any case. 
And another gift uh, to this wonderful collection at the Historical Society was uh, a lot of material that was acquired by Bishop <clears throat> Bishop Whipple, who was the first Episcopal bishop in Minnesota. He came in 1850, 18, yeah, 1849, and he died in 1901. And he worked a lot with the Native communities, and 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 uh, many lay ministers um, were um, trained by him and and worked with their own communities. This is Sophia Smith, uh, Sophia LaRouche Smith, and Sophia LaRouche. And we found quite a bit on her um, in the, some of the genealogy records. In the collections at MHS, there are 10. These are cards that are almost eight by 10. They're really big uh, photo bound cards. And there are nine or 10 of them. And most of them are, this is the only odd one. The others all have her just wearing her dress. And in this one, she's wearing a bed jacket over that dress, which is kind of interesting, I think. Um, she's also wearing a piece of lace around her neck, which was part of another uh, indigenous training program the Episcopal and Catholic churches were sponsoring at that time. So my guess is that it's also a piece of Indian lace. And she's holding a bag, the card uh, that, uh, one of the cards that, um, Uh, has written on the back that she is holding the last fire bag made for Bishop Whipple. Um, and um, fire bag was one of many names for these bags uh, when they existed historically. Now look at the bag on the right. That bag that is in the collections is the bag that she's holding in the photograph. Uh, pay attention to the colorways, meaning all the palettes of the beads chosen. There's two more bags in that collection without the specific provenance uh, in terms of being associated with uh, Sophia. Let me go back. Um, this bag is the only one that can, continues to be a pocket bag. These are both panel bags where the pocket has um, vanished from the front. Now look at the left side of the strap on all three of these bags. They all incorporate a somewhat unique uh, motif uh, to Sophia and her beadwork group um, is this half Minnesota rose. Uh, Chippewa Rose, uh, which is cut in half with uh, another element coming out of the top of it. You can see it on this one too. And she has one in that panel, sort of almost a half one there. And I think, is there another one? Yes, there's another one in that panel. And I think you probably recognize these little um, Love Apple guys. Um, you can just see, um, there's a feeling of the quality and um, the movement in the three bags, but they're also distinctive hands too. And I suspect that she was a, a, a wife of a lay minister for decades on both White Earth and Red Lake. And I'm sure that she had other church women from the reservation that she spent time with. And no doubt she and maybe her own family spent time um, beading together. And so they shared their um, source of beads and maybe inspired each other. I suspect both of these were made by Sophia or certainly she had a hand in the design. Um, Grand Portage um, is uh, one of the reservations where I tracked down a three generation uh, family of uh, be be uh, bandolier bag makers. Um, on the left photograph is uh, Mary Posey on the right, and her husband, Alec, and their foster child, Ellen Bushman. She is wearing a strap for a very small bandolier bag, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, in this picture, I suspect this was maybe going to be a postcard or was an advertisement for the range of work that Mary Posey did. She also worked at um, the fort up at Grand Portage, and so she did demonstrations up there. So it might have been for sales in the gift shop. And there is some um, Ellen Bushman, again, sort of wearing it and holding the gear. And she's still wearing the bandolier bag. There's the strap of it. And here, in a, probably an earlier picture, is Alec Posey wearing the bag. 
and look how small it is. Look how how but how much more diminutive it is compared to some of the other bags that we've looked at re recently. And um, so there's two qualities of the bags from uh, Graham Portage that we have documented is this size and the fact that um, the strap um, and the top of this area above the pocket were continuous and it also curved rather than coming straight across. So um, if you look in my book, you'll see other examples of it, but um, very distinctive um, elements uh, that were tied to the um, bags uh, seen at, at Grand Portage, including, um, I think a few of them, more than a couple, have um, ribbons uh, tied at the bottom for fringe instead of uh, beads. So this is uh, generation number two. This is Ellen Bushman, the little girl growing up, and she's Ellen Bushman Olson. So she has a floral spot stitch bag that she made in, um, oh, let's see, when was it? Um, uh, not sure, but um, in 1992, I think it was donated to the uh, Plains Art Museum. But this bag, which is not spot stitch, but is loom woven, is uh, in her personal collection. She still had it when I last met with her. And this is her daughter, Generation 3, Marcy McIntyre, who is also a bag maker. And clearly her work is very distinctly, distinctly different from her mother's and her grandmother's. Um, most of her bags, I think, are owned by the band, and one of them is usually on display in the government center. She also makes mucklucks and all kinds of uh, leather goods, and she's a really talented uh, craftswoman. So, one of the other rich, rich um, components of the collections at MHS is the photographic work of Monroe Keeley. He lived to be about 100. Um, spent from the time of about, about 70 years, um, decades, uh, visiting the tribes around the reservations in Minnesota. I think he did go to Wisconsin too, but mostly Minnesota, and took pictures as well as acquired a collection. And um, what was really wonderful is he often uh, bought some examples from individuals and then asked them to hold the objects and photograph them. So he had the record of the object uh, made by the maker and uh, the date and everything. So <clears throat> one of those kind of um, uh, collectors that you, you seek out. He um, visited many people, but this is a couple, um, Mr. and Mrs. Jack King, and he did actually in his note say that he asked Mrs. King what her own name was, Medi Gogwan, and uh, that is her. She told Monroe that she made all of her husband's beadwork and, and her own. And so this is their log cabin house, and um, they lived at Leech Lake. They were members of the pillager group. And um, inside was their uh, Sears catalog furniture. And behind her there and on the dresser are other pieces of beadwork and textiles. And you'll see that she's wearing these two bags um, in this where she's seated. Well, the photograph isn't of the same quality, but this is her standing wearing the two bags. And because uh, her hand isn't in the way, you can see that little faux opening in, done in beadwork that she's made two of those panel bags that are non-functioning, non-functioning bandolier bags. Uh, we don't know uh, about any of her work. Uh, apparently Monroe didn't collect any of it, or if he did, he, um, it left his collection before we um, knew about it. And then there are these families at Mille Lacs with names like Shewab, Shewap, and Shewab. And we don't know if there really were three very different um, families um, and uh, or if it was just a non-native person doing phonetic spelling that was not accurate. However, usually when we found historic photos of native people that was because they were also involved with some of the interactions with visitors or tourists or at, at the Mille Lacs Indian Museum, for example, the heirs. And so there would be photographs of them because of their interaction. And this is a picture of Mrs. John Shewab. And um, we don't know anything else about her, just that. And she's seated on the grass in front of one of their demonstration um, 
bark dwellings that they built for tourists. But we also have a photograph of someone named John Shewa, whose name is beaded on the strap, uh, wearing a bandolier bag, which this used to be. At some point it was disassembled and turned into a um, dance uh, skirt or um, breech cloth set up. Uh, so the pocket panel is the front panel of the breech cloth and there's a big chunk of red wool uh, for the back and then the strap uh, is used around the waist and has uh, hook and eye attachments. And the panel is very typical of lax motifs, uh, very unusual, um, unnatural, uh, interesting forms, uh, but arranged in a floral-like manner. But the strap, to me, looks like a giant vine of squash, and I love it. It's, uh, I've never seen anything like it, and um, it's a beautiful piece of beadwork with a lot of bead loss, but it was happy once. Another really well-known photograph with good documentation, another Shewab um, collection uh, piece, but um, here these two uh, individuals are wearing clearly all of their family's beadwork for this photograph. And um, I looked at it many, many, many times. And then I also spent a lot of time looking at auctions online to look for other pieces that might be in our photograph collection. And there was the yoke. It was in a small auction in Wisconsin and we were able to get it for the collections. And um, it came to us on, tacked onto a black shirt, which was really typical for um, powwow garb. You were all white, all brown, or all black, a pants and a shirt, so that the beadwork jumped out from the, the backdrop of your clothing. And uh, I love that this came still tacked to the shirt. Uh, and again, the cornucopia and the, and the fun layered uh, elements that were typical of Malak's. So those two ladies that got me started on this journey, um, Maudie Keg, who could do anything and everything, um, loved this bag in the air collection. And so the, she decided like many bead artists, they had to have at least one Ojibwe, a bandolier bag, uh, an iconic bag in their collection of beadwork. And so she reproduced it in her own way and really only kept kept the pocket panel was the closest to the original. And she also made loom woven um, fringe tabs, which was really nice. And that ended up in the North uh, Great Plains, uh, Plains Art Museum. Um, and also, I think that went there about 1982. So she made that quite a while ago. Matisse Sam, the other lady who got me um, started on all of this, um, also had to make one last, uh, I had to make a bandolier bag before she passed on. And this one she made in 1995. Matisse was, was a diminutive lady. And this bag, I think there's a picture of it in the book of her wearing it and it pretty much touches the ground. Um, so uh, it was a really big bag and it was very typical of her clean, um, simple, um, elegant uh, beadwork. The other one, for the book was Ivy Aleport. She had this beautiful screen porch at White Earth where she did all of her work. Um, and things started to pick up again in the 70s and 80s when uh, the folks started dancing again and wearing regalia. Well, she, she and her husband wanted to, but they didn't know how to make it. And so she learned from friends and relatives um, how to do that. This is the first uh, dance regalia outfit she made for her husband, Harry. And, um, and we were visiting her in 2002 and back there uh, in process was, uh, you can see that's a US flag. She uh, wanted to make a 9-11 commemorative bag for her family to keep as a, a, as a you know, souvenir, but not to leave the family a remembrance. And so um, that's what she was working on then. And so she decided uh, at, at some encouragement from us that she would make a bandolier bag for the collections at the Historical Society, which she did. And uh, the tabs are loom woven with tassels and that's a bear uh, paw because uh, she was a member of the bear clan. She had a faux opening on the front of her bag, but she did have a real bag opening up backside, which is a cool idea. If you're wearing something, you could just tuck in the back side of your bag and, and reach for things. Um, and uh, so this is probably 
uh, sometime after 2003 or sometime in the first half of the 2000s. Um, this is uh, Ivy and Harry at the White Earth Pow Wow. And you can see that Harry's wearing the finished 9-11 uh, bag. Um, and he just probably sitting down after dancing. This is Mel Lash. He was the only gentleman in the group of women, uh, of individuals I interviewed for the book. And the women gave me permission to have a guy there because, you know, traditionally it was uh, women who made the Vandalier bags and a lot of the beadwork. Um, but Mel uh, never made his bags for use or for dancing. They were made as art objects. And so he had made almost 30 by the time um, the book was finished. He's probably still at it. And um, this one is the one that was acquired for the collections. Uh, and it was made by, he was a leech laker, and it was made by him uh, sometime between 1980 and 86. Ah! And, um, He's uh, really well known for both his spot stitch work and his uh, uh, quill work. He's a very a well recognized uh, artisan. And this bag he made um, was kind of inspired by some sort of historical uh, concepts because the early, early bags of this type were made out of animal skins and furs. And so um, the back side of the pocket panel area is uh, a fur skin, which we can't see here. And then the pocket uh, panel itself um, is a section of birch bark, which he did quill work flowers in. So it's a really amazing bag. And actually, I think it might be on display right now. Um, it often is. The last of my uh, group that was uh, interviewed uh, for the book is Cheryl Minima, the youngster. Um, the bag on the left is uh, from 2007. And it was the inspiration for a, a kit that um, the Historical Society has made for school kids. And, and they um, are, it's a shoulder bag kit and it's her bag design. Kids can color on them or decorate them. And the backside and the strap are blank so kids can collect leaves and make their own designs. They've been hugely successful and popular with boys and girls. Um, this is Cheryl holding one of her other bags, uh, more recent one um, in the 2000s. There she is in 2010, uh, and making this bag uh, commemorating her mother, Millie Benjamin, another elder at Mille Lacs, who passed on in 2010. And her favorite flower was the sunflowers. So um, Cheryl introduced a, a little known uh, uh, motif uh, uh, for this bag, which turned out to be great. And so here it is, the resurgence of Goshka Badagans. Um, this one um, are both images from Facebook, so it's showing up everywhere now. Um, on the left is Anton Troyer wearing um, one of a few bags that were made at the Science Museum. It was kind of a public project. People could come in and help uh, do beadwork on the, the bags that were in process. I don't remember how many they made, but... Um, um, Doug Lehman designed them and, and managed this project. And then on the right is um, a 2014 photo uh, showing three bags on the three women uh, made by Travis DeBungi of Ponema, Pon Ponema. And um, the women are Babette Sandman, Monique Paulson, and Dora Ammon. And Anton is wearing on the far end a bag by Connie Ribard of St. Croix, Wisconsin. So here it is, it's, uh, it's come um, all the way around and they're popular again. They're, most of them are kind of, I would say lightweight, not quite as uh, fully, uh, as many layers and as much work as the earlier ones. But it's nice to see that these women are, this um, Travis is making his with the uh, partially um, opened uh, opening, really you can barely get a hand in but that they do function. And um, you can see the, how long they are. The straps are very long. Um, and talk, I mean, and see the difference between a shorter one and how it sits on the hip. So that's the end of my presentation. I've probably talked you all to death and um, I'm ready to answer um, any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, 
so let's let's see here. Um, let me take some questions first from the room um, here. Do you all have questions? Yes, Ken. I, I arrived late, so it's going to answer the work last year, but Jennifer, I don't know if you were in the a distinction between uh, Dakota bags and Ojibwe bags? Good question. Yeah, I'll repeat that uh, for you, Marcia. Uh, did, were you yeah. able to hear? That's fine, yeah. Um, the question was, what is the main distinction between an Ojibwe bag and um, something made by Dakota tribe? Is there a distinction between those? Um, I, I guess, um, you know, that's becoming a cultural question that's not mine to speak to. But when you look at historic photographs, um, you know, they're, they're manipulated by the person taking the photograph. But um, lots of times, like the pictures of sod houses where settlers have all their furniture sitting out front, they're showing off their, bed, their piano and their rocking chair and everything. Well, I think when a lot of uh, Native people historically post posed for these photographs, they wanted to show uh, their, the things that they, that, the, that were precious to them that they maybe used regularly, they considered um, uh, a, a real part of who they were. And uh, the Plains photos are mostly of pipe bags and other kinds of things, and a bandolier bag is not um, an element that shows up in historical photos. But a lot of the Ojibwe people and Dakota people moved out west and moved into different reservations and mixed. And I know that a lot of the um, folks in Minnesota, you know, Ojibwe wife and a Dakota husband, there's all kinds of mixed marriages. And, and to say that they're not being influenced by each other's artistic preferences and traditions is uh, false. But I would say if you looked at the historical photographs, there really wasn't a bandolier bag form in some of the Dakota uh, photographs. I can't really answer. I don't think I answered your question perfectly, but. Uh, she said good enough. <laughs> um, I wanted to take a quick pause and let the folks on Zoom know if you have a question, please send it in the chat. You can send it to everyone. That way um, I can see it and forward it to Marcia. So we do have another question in person though. Go ahead. I have a couple of questions. I yes. was not familiar with bandolier bags. Uh -huh. I guess what what was the function? Okay. Why are they called bandolier and where did they get the early, early beads? Excellent. Yes. Um, so a couple, a couple different questions here. Um, the purpose of the bandolier bag, if you could speak to that, and um, the, where did they get the beads is the second one. What was the last one? Oh, the name bandolier bag. And also, where does the name bandolier bag come oh, from? Oh, yes. I saved some of those three. all of your questions. Okay. <laughs> the first one is always the question everybody asks. And after 30 some years, I still don't know the answer. What was the function <laughs> of the bandolier bag? Um, they didn't seem to carry much in them. Um, sometimes uh, medicine, sometimes tobacco. Um, I wouldn't get historically and even in the writings historically, they just didn't have the kind of bag function we would expect them to have. Like, is there lunch in there? Is there, you know, their, their pocketbook? I mean, what did they carry in these things? And I really think that um, what I kind of came up with for one of the presentations I did, that this was really a kind of cultural armor. Because when they wore these, um, you can see a bandolier bag on a, on a pair of, of black pants and a black shirt from one end of a football field. That's how distinctive they are, how visually um, impressive they are. And, and uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of criticism about bead work, uh, the work of uh, Indian women in the early 20th century and late 19th century and a lot of criticisms, but if you look at the advertisements for the, the traders and the uh, merchants that near the reservations, the ads would say, uh, no beadwork available till after the powwow. So a lot of these uh, individuals were making these things to feed their families. And um, it was uh, both a precious thing and a, uh, economically vital thing, but 
when they were wearing them, well, they were they were special, and everybody wanted them, and everybody came to see them at the powwow at Wide Earth. So, so I do think it was a uh, it became that, and certainly by the 20th century when they were panel bags, it was like a walking painting. I mean, they were they were walking around with the canvas uh, across their shoulder. Um, beautiful. Second question was. Uh, where did the beads come from? And also just the name bandolier bag also. Uh, the, the beads usually came from the mer mercantiles and the traders uh, who, were, who had the shops uh, near the reservation. Um, you would, uh, at Mille Lacs, that was a big part of the uh, uh, trading post at Mille Lacs was the bead room. And, and they had yeah, tons of beads, um, hanks of beads. And you would come there. You might trade um, fur skins. Uh, for beads or ribbon or whatever it is you wanted or flour or sugar, but um, you would get your beads there. And the last thing I'm going to read to you, um, they didn't really call them um, bandolier bags. They didn't know what to call them. And in my book, here's my reference to, um, this is why the research was so difficult. Terms that were used to docu to describe a bit what I call a bandolier bag or a goshka bedoggin were big bag, bead bag, beaded bag, bead sack, beaded pouch, beadwork pouch, beaded bag outfit, beautiful beadwork, tobacco pouch, uh, hunting bag, ceremonial bag, um, ceremonial Indian beaded bag, pony bag, fire bag, dance bag, medicine bag, uh, it goes on and on like that, shoulder bag. I mean, it was so challenging to um, to find out uh, what I was reading about. If this was, you know, a tobacco bag or was this what I'm looking at? And, and eventually you start to tell by how they're describing the object and what it's used for that that's what it is. But what a challenge. With you, you can't even find um, the actual name. Uh, for the object in regular use. And um, the bandolier part is, is a, comes from a French word for the belt that it goes across your shoulder and down below your uh, arm on the other side, that's a bandolier. And so the Europeans that first described them um, called them bandoliers and it went. I think I answered all your questions. <laughs> Yeah, um, the next question actually comes to us from the chat from Jennifer, and she sent a photo, which I will send in an email to you so you can see it closer, and um, she's looking forward to talking to you about her great-grandfather's bandolier bag. She just right. came in to, to care for that, so um, I'll forward that to you. There is still, um, I'm probably going to mispronounce this, uh, a SEMA, or tobacco in the pocket. <laughs> That's a neat, a neat detail. Um, and she notes that uh, the bead and yarn fringe on his bag and is wondering if that bean and, uh, bead and yarn fringe, for to say, uh, is an add-on or if that's more traditional. And I'm just gonna, I know this isn't the best way, but I'm gonna hold it up so you might be able to see it, Marcia. Oh, yeah, because uh, she's, I've seen that, that picture of her bag. Okay. Yes, that is, uh, those are a little short from what I've seen, but yes, that's, um, a very, uh, I, that's why I always comment when I say that, that this artist made a woven tab fringe, which is a lot of work. But um, once the spot stitch floral bags came into popularity, it was looped um, fringe or, or uh, individual ties, like you would knot a rug, uh, individuals uh, every so centimeters or so. Uh, was a loop of uh, a certain kind of bead, and then there'd be a yarn, a dyed yarn wool tassel at the bottom of that. That's very traditional, very traditional, very common. Other questions from Yeah, go ahead. There you are, Jennifer. Hi. <laughs> um, so the, the presentation started basically at the start of when we had photography technology, and it looks like the bags were pretty established in kind of the standard of how they look. Like, do you have, you know, like other kinds of visual art predating topography that shows them or even just, you know, oral stories that kind of show how far back the tradition goes? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so to, to repeat that for you, um, the photos that we saw towards the beginning of the presentation, it looks like the beadwork was already fairly established in terms of design um, and craft at that point. Um, besides the finger woven bags, are there any other oral histories, anything written down that might talk about the origins of them that aren't necessarily through photography? Is that summarized? Okay. Um, that was a difficult part of the research because um, what exists before that is um, paintings and lithography and um, not as accurate um, as a photograph um, because then it was interpreted by the artist. Um, there are examples of paintings in uh, Wisconsin chiefs wearing um, very small, what we might call a bandolier bag, but what there were before bandolier bags were a, a kind of um, powder bag that often had a horn for the powder attached to it. It was often worn uh, around the front uh, so that it was like wearing um, a bib kind of, and, and the panel was facing it. It was, it was very small, couldn't be tucked under your arm or over your shoulder, it was much too small for that. So there were pre, I call those precursors. If you go to any of this early um, geographic uh, reports from the feds um, in Washington in the 1800s, you'll see engravings by the explorers. And there's always these little pouches and bags, the precursors, and some of them are, are um, quilled, some of them are um, woven uh, with patterns like uh, underwater panthers and some of them are beaded leather. But um, I think of them as precursors, I think of them as not really um, the transition to the bandolier bags. I think, I really think um, the indigenous uh, community was very pragmatic and they needed money to um, feed their families and do other things and they found that this sort of decorative object appealed to the non-native community that would spend money for their work. I, I don't think that's the only answer, but I do think it was an incentive. Uh, yeah, so, another question. So then maybe the invention of photography and this trend of displaying, yeah. you know, regalia, maybe it goes hand in hand with the development of photography. Mm -hmm. A follow-up to that. Um, would it be possible that the photography kind of was used as a tool and the more of the advent of advertising with photography, did those sort of go hand in hand, maybe? So is the questionnaire <laughs> the existence of photographs that inspire other people to continue to do this and develop the Vandalier Bank, is that what he's saying? Um, more so as photography became more common, did creating the bags to sell in advertisements and tourist spots oh. and stuff, uh, did those go hand in hand or not so much? No, I, the advertisements in the newspapers were all in print. They were, they didn't have photographs. Um, the people that came to the big powwows like the White Earth powwow took photographs with those early cameras. Um, I don't think I remember seeing anybody that was doing a sketchbook that we have. That doesn't mean there wasn't one. Um, and um, I've looked at all kinds of archives in the states around here and in and Duluth and everywhere. Um, it just, uh, the, the earliest bags that were documented as bandolier bags are are still pretty small, but you could actually wear it over your shoulder. And they're all dated to 1851, and they're from a collection in Wisconsin. They're published, but there's two of them. That's it, you know. So, um, and if you look at the finger woven bags, they're bigger, and they're not huge. And in the first photos I showed you in the slideshow, um, they made I made the point of saying that they were much smaller than the ones that Pete Moose was wearing, those giant ones. But um, the early ones were, they were more purse-like. They, they, um, they functioned, I think, more, I don't know, maybe they, they, maybe they used them for many things, but all of the people I was able to interview, and that was the old people that I met when I started this, um, that they were 
they went back the farthest and they didn't even remember ever seeing Vandalier Beggs worn at dances. So, mm -hmm. so that there's a gap in the history there that we've lost that connection to know, you know, further back when they were first uh, created, why and, and what was the goal. Does that answer, answer your question? Great. Other questions? I have two questions. <laughs> um, our bandolier bags that we have in the lobby here, we noticed that in the designs, there are a few beads that don't go perfectly in the color. So if you have like a pink flower, there might be a blue bead right in the middle. Do you know what the reasoning for that is? Yeah, that's a, I don't know. <laughs> a lot of oh, my- Jennifer chimed in and said spirit beads. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, certainly a lot of uh, non-native people call them that. Um, and I've had some of my bead artists say, yeah, well, I don't want it to be perfect. Uh, you know, uh, it, I, I guess there's not a consensus, but certainly that's one of the, one of the things people say about them. Yeah. Okay. And then in the more recent photos, you showed uh, some wonderful ladies with white backgrounds, and there was one with more of a turquoise background. Is that more of a modern look? Um, okay, my, I, you have to get the book, but um, yes. <laughs> my favorite color, because um, uh, I like the name of it, from the, mm, the last half of the 1800s was greasy yellow. It was this really great sort of orangey yellow, really intense, and um, that was the one color that would kind of show up every once in a while as a background in uh, uh, bandolier bags or other beaded uh, things. But the, the uh, okay, when it started out, when the first um, recorded spot stitch floral bags, they were on velvet. I don't think much of it was velvet because velvet's way too slippery to work on, but it was probably cotton velveteen, which most of what we saw was that. Um, yeah, that's like Matisse bag that she made before she died. She used to use the back black background. She wasn't going to sew seven million beads in the background for her flowers. Um, the, whole, the whole work uh, of the spot stitch bags is enormous because the Ojibwe women sew all of that background in, all of it, and the traditional color was white. You can see the occasional odd one and like greasy yellow, but um, what's, what does appear is uh, crystal, um, sparkly. They're all variants, but they're pretty much all white versions of white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Other questions from the room? Great. I think we are, are good on questions. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> you can hear us clapping. <laughs> um, and again, for you folks who are on chat, um, feel free to stop by the Heritage Center and pick up a copy of Marsha's book. Um, and we have them for sale, of course, for you all in person as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much again. We really, really appreciate it. Okay. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Never get all the way out. <laughs>